So these people I do know. Uh, this is the Wolfgang and Penrose. And here are two guys that you don't know, but I do. These are Farm Optics people. Eddie Newman. Yeah, yeah. And Zeininger is at the uh, University of, of, uh, of Vienna or which university is he with? Uh, Entanglement, quantum computing, the ideas of uh, two regions, space time, coupled by a quantum mechanical bond, which we call entanglement for reasons that you'll see, I hope, in a minute, <clears throat> comprises half of this new graph. So here is uh, Zeilinger and uh, Kali, and uh, here is, of course, our hero Wolfgang and Kali, looking further to uh, <laughs> the attributes of uh, Wolfgang. You, you see here Wolfgang and uh, one of his very early students, Eric, who was, of course, a student of Wolfgang's from uh, the beginning, right? And so here he's teaching dad something of war, I guess. And here we have a picture which I love, but of course I don't know who this is. Who is that? Is that you? Yeah. <laughs> All right. And so here I uh, assumed that you were taking the wisdom of the oracle down on the left. Great, great pictures, great pictures. Thank you. Now, I'd like to share with you in the next uh, few minutes these ideas of entanglement of uh, uh, wave particle duality and show you, in a certain sense, how it is that the Rindler method, Rindler uh, manifestation of uh, entanglement, it goes far beyond what anyone would ever have guessed when Wolfgang uh, did his, his uh, first words. Oh, by the way, there's a gentleman named David Lee, who has the Nobel Prize in Physics, and is my friend who I was fortunate to hire at Texas A&M. And, uh, and uh, he was coming into my office one day, and what are you doing? And I'm working here on the Rindler Minkowski interface. He says, Rindler? I know Rinder. He was at Cornell. And uh, I was glad to, to hear this. Uh, he was at the mathematics department. Were you married then? Well, the ideas now of entanglement, the farm computing, the ideas of uh, the Rinder Kowski interface are something like it. In, in a few lines, uh, the greatest physicists of the 19th century, and in many ways, on the par with Einstein, Newton, Maxwell made a profound observation that I've always appreciated. It says, when you look at the great discoverers and face their lives, the development of the ideas becomes the most fascinating. Take for example, Young. Young was a, 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 a physicist of the first order, but he was trained as a physician. And it was Young who really taught us that light is more like wave-like behavior than particle-like behavior, right? right? More like waves in water than like beads being shot uh, one after another. And uh, it uh, was this particle aspect of things that most scientists adhere to uh, up to uh, uh, the uh, time of, of uh, um, and of that time, I wonder if I have that, no, it's coming up. So 50 ideas, and amongst the 50 ideas, entanglement and wave particle duality is very important. So young, is the guy we are trying to understand better. And no 
better way of doing and wave particle interference than to think about the surface of a pond in which we excite waves. I, I love YouTube, and uh, I found a couple of uh, YouTube uh, presentations which were particularly helpful in trying to communicate these ideas. Now, uh, this next one is very nice, and I hope it works. Let's get her uh, a little pond where we can see this with water waves. I have two sources of ripples, which are basically like the two slits. When I create ripples with a single source, they travel out with circular wave fronts. Nothing particularly surprising there. But if I add a second source of ripples, then we start getting an interesting pattern. This pattern is created by the ripples from the two sources interacting with each other. Where they meet up peaks with peaks and troughs with troughs, the amplitude of the wave is increased. That's what we call constructive interference. But if the peak from one wave meets up with the trough from the other, then we get destructive interference and there's basically no wave there. So it's this kind of wave-like nature of life that Young explained to us by interference and showed experimentally in a beautiful experiment hundreds of years ago that life first, last, and always is a wave-like behavior. Some particle-like attributes are equally important, but uh, uh, this is the essence of wave aspect. Now, here we see the timeline coming in, and uh, I was wanting to emphasize Young here, beginning of the 19th century, did his famous experiment. And uh, we go forward uh, to quantum mechanics and wave like behavior of the electron. <clears throat> Another one of these YouTube presentations that I liked a lot. Uh, this one's a, a little more uh, uh, dramatic and uh, cartoony, but but very well done. So if, if you can uh, bear with uh, some of the cartoon features here, uh, our top performer explains this wave particle as well. It's not the lowest thing I've ever seen described. And here we are, with granddaddy of all lots of weirdness, the infamous double slit experiment. To understand this experiment, we first need to see how particles or little balls of matter act. If we randomly shoot a small object, say a marble, at the screen, we can see a pattern on the back wall where they went through the slit and hit. Now, if we add a second slit, we would expect to see a second band duplicated to the right. Now, let's look at waves. The waves hit the slit and radiate out, striking the back wall with the most intensity directly in line with the slit. The line of brightness on the back screen shows that intensity. This is similar to the line the marbles make. But when we add the second slit, something different happens. If the top of one wave meets the bottom of another wave, they cancel each other out. So now there is an interference pattern on the back wall. Places where the two tops meet are the highest intensity, the bright lines. Where they cancel, there is nothing. So, when we throw things, that is, matter, through two slits, we get this, two bands of things. And with waves, we get an interference pattern of many things. Good, so far. Now, let's go quantum. Tiny bit of matter, like a tiny mark. Let's fire a screen through one slit. And just like the mark, a single band. So, if we 
shoot these tiny bits through two slits. We should get like the marbles through the air. What? An interference pack. We fired electrons, tiny bits of matter. We could have them like waves, not like little marbles. How? How do pieces of matter create an interference pattern like a wave? Doesn't make sense. But physicists are clever. They thought maybe those little balls are bouncing off each other and creating that pattern. So they decide to shoot the electrons through one at a time. There is no way they can interfere with each other. But after an hour of this, the same interference pattern is seen to have learned. The conclusion is inescapable. The single electron leaves as a particle, becomes a wave of potentials, goes through both slits, and interferes with itself to hit the wall like a particle. But mathematically, it's even stranger. It goes through both slits and it goes through neither. And it goes through just one and it goes through just the other. All of these possibilities are in superposition with each other. But physicists were completely baffled by this. So, Decided to leave and see if they slip and those. They put a measure in place by one slip, see which one it went through, and let it fall. But the quantum world is far more mysterious than they could have imagined. What they observed, the electron went back to behaving like a little marble. It produced a pattern of two bands. Not an interference pattern of many. The very act of measuring or observing which slit it went through meant it only went through one, not both. The electron decided to act. So, so here, it's being watched. It's here that physicists step forever into the strange never world of quantum events. Or waves. And waves of what? And what does the observer have to do with waves? The observer collapsed the wave function. And this is the regular metric. Particular, some years ago, I was working with a young uh, guy to try to do it. He started asking me a question this eye, this all seeing eye, that we just heard about, what if we erase the information stored in that observer? Remember, looking in some sense, knowing. Way the uh, interference pattern could the eraser of that information, the eraser of what's in, say, for example, the mind of the observer, quote unquote, could that, in, in some sense, uh, uh, restore the interference pattern? So that's what we were thinking about uh, theoretically, philosophically, and Zeidinger, whose pictures we saw earlier, uh, observed this. Later, now, if I can, you know, this uh, uh, newsweek uh, sidebar explained the idea uh, after the experiments came on in, in, a, in a nice way. And uh, I'd like to just now walk through this with you so that you can see the connection between wave particle duality. Let's do the previous uh, movie, YouTube movie. We've known for some time that uh, the beam of light and the flashlight incident on two slits gives us what they call this uh, uh, Venetian blind pattern. But then we find out that the presence of an observer rubs out that pattern, not because of some kind of interaction between the observer and the observed, but 
simply because we now have knowledge. We now have some information. Now we discover that when we make that observation, but we move the knowledge, erase the knowledge, the strike pattern returns. And as we said, long after the photons pass, even after they have passed through the slits, bring back the strikes. It's as if the past has changed. No wonder Einstein was confused. Yes. And here is something beautiful and I, I want to put it. Einstein, of course, gave us general relativity in Minkowski and Lindbergh. <coughs> but Einstein got the Nobel Prize for what? Making his theory of relativity? No. So the concept of the photon, Einstein gave us not only the concept of the photon, but the concept of stimulated emission, which has made my whole living all my life. The laser device that is the uh, background for the kind of things that we're making. Now, moving on to the philosophical implications of these ideas and the connection in the deep sense between entanglement, as we've seen it here, Racer of information that we've seen it here, and entanglement between two versions of space time. I'd like to share with you some of the philosophical implications and some of the ideas that, uh, uh, if I were smart, are classic friends. And Dennis, thank you very much for providing a platform for this. The ideas behind Finland's version of relativity of space, on the one hand, associated with uh, uh, Einstein and Minkowski, and on the other hand, associated with Rinder and Andrew and Hopkins. So let me tell you in a few. Address a few slides. Some of the ways in which these insights have impacted our philosophical, in some sense, even theological. The great mathematician, Herman Bio, said, The mathematician steps before you and speaks about God, speaks without hesitation about the notion of God. Now, as a mathematical enthusiast, um, I love mathematics. I love uh, uh, this whole subject. In fact, it was the thing that brought me into a, a university life. I grew up in Wyoming, and uh, my people were homesteaders. And I love the outdoors, the hunting, the fishing. And I thought, well, maybe I'll be a geologist. I can make a living and uh, practice my real love, which is fly fishing and deer hunting. So I went to university, but I screwed up. I took a course in calculus, and that was the beginning of the end. I love that. <laughs> and um, my, one of my jobs, I had the pleasure to work. For this guy, Feshbach. And he, together with Morse, wrote a beautiful book in which they point out that for a couple of years, we're not out of time, to expand the Matthew functions in terms of a Fourier series, sines and cosines, according to certain amplitudes. And you expand the Matthew function in terms of Bessel functions to get amplitudes. Lo and behold, these amplitudes are essentially the same thing. What a profound observation. It's very deep. And someday I hope to spend more time studying this fact, but this is what caused our friend Eschbach to make the statement that the Matthew equation and this kind of of uh, Rinder Minkowski like sameness but differentiation. 
its manifestation of what they call the unity faith and the unity and simplicity of not the other. But Bigner, our, our great friends, you've heard your physicists have heard of Bigner's friends, right? The guy who was making the observation, which Bigner told us to think about, we often call Bigner's friend. Had the great honor of being one of Richard's friends. We were writing a paper late one night and said, Now, here's where the big new friend concept comes in. Richard said, That's the big friend. But I said, All of us agree with what you said. And he said, You are a big new friend. Gene Binger, very polite guy from the area, wonderful. Scientist, very, very polite. Had a confrontation with a New York taxi cab driver. Got out of the taxi, slammed the door, and said to the taxi driver, Go to hell, please. <laughs> <laughs> the notion of this is upon an entropy. Is something that forms, on the one hand, the basis for engineering and thermodynamics, entropy of the essence of heat engine operation. And on the other hand, the essence of order, disorder, and the mathematical connection between them shows for the first time. The connection between something that's strictly psychological, strictly in our mind, entropy, the concept of order, disorder, and the statement, as one of them would tell us, S equals rho of rho. This concept and the notion of time go together. Entropy is, as someone said, is time zero. Trinidad. Schrodinger, the father of modern wave mechanics, Heisenberg and Schrodinger uh, were the father together of modern flow mechanics. But Schrodinger notion, Schrodinger's notion of past and future is summarized in this fifth statement. He says, to my view, the statistical theory of time has an even stronger bearing on philosophy. Than the theory of relativity. This idea, or so I believe, is the indestructibility of mind by time. Indestructibility of mind by time. Now, let's go forward. We had a conference. In Bavarian elves back in, in the early 80s, back in the time when we were thinking about um, entanglement in the part of the race. And by the way, the word entanglement was invented by Trinity. And we had a, a conference um, uh, back then discussing these ideas. And uh, Eugene Bigner and uh, John Weaver, who were the mainstays of the conference. And one of my students, who was uh, uh, Kritsky, and now lead professor uh, in Israel at the Weizmann Institute, uh, was a uh, uh, this feature of our conference. Every time you saw Bigner, you saw a friend of Bigner's. The quantum eraser concept uh, is a good example of how classical and quantum concepts of time can be understood, holding one into another. Uh, Yakir Baharanov and Zahir Zabari wrote this in a, in a nice uh, uh, science article, some of about celebrating the 1905 Einstein. Here we say for the second time in history, Subjectivity 
or psychological state of mind, impact science. First time being introduced, the concept of introduced. This subjective something now is called psi, the state vector. So here we're now once again coming into the notion of correlation and angle. But quantum erasure, this uh, statement again comes from this nice article by the Kier Kaparama and Suhail Zavari. Zavari is now a professor, distinguished professor at Texas AM, and uh, uh, Kaparama is a television. And they say that the quantum eraser concept dramatically underscores the difference between our classical concept of time and how quantum processes can unfold in time. And indeed, the Lindbergh and Kowski system is a great example of how the Einstein concepts of Waldivian time translated into the language we use today by Minkowski and the Lindbergh concept of how that time changes from the going of an accelerated frame is very, very uh, germane mathematically uh, to this uh, business of entanglement. <clears throat> very surprising. As Niels Bohr said, anyone who is not shocked by quantum theory has not understood. Uh, I once had the good fortune to ask Peter at the large conference, John. Give us your 20 word definition of time. He said, Time, higgly piggly, bit by bit, the parts make up the whole. What do you mean by that? Beautiful say simply that random motion between, say, atoms in a little ball of gas, colliding. Forcing the ball to a bigger and bigger dimension. And that dimension can give us a clock. In fact, it does give us a clock. And it's in this sense that Schrodinger says statistical time, that's the real focus. And that's deeper in his mind eye than is the relativity uh, concept of time of uh, Einstein. But now, I wish they had time to go back. Discuss how Minkowski and Lindbergh give us two entangled versions of this kind of uh, space time. We, we discussed that yesterday in the physics department. But looking forward to continuing that research in the next months. Now, how do these ideas fit together in, in some sort of uh, fabric or tapestry that we can all understand and take away in 20 word Quilleres statements? Plato first said, if it were not for that recognition, the recognition of life, of the forms, of the ideas, if it weren't. For the stars themselves, we wouldn't have time. If we didn't have a backdrop to measure time against, time wouldn't exist. Uh, deep, uh, uh, profound insights way ahead of its time. Really, he said later on no phenomenon is a physical phenomenon until it is an observed phenomenon. He was one of the first people. To put this observation concept into the mathematical framework, and that led to the quantum eraser kind of ideas, which were uh, tested experimentally. Yeah. Oh, uh, a, a nice book by Agnes says uh, that. Uh, the presence, presence of observation and 
he highlighted the notion of consciousness. Today we think that consciousness can be uh, product even by a simple photo detector. So it's the idea of entanglement of correlation between the observed and the observer, between the object to be studied and the device that we use to make the measurement. And uh, quite simply, conscious observers are the essence, he says, of physical reality. One of my favorite professors in graduate school uh, at Yale was Henry Marginal. Physicists will know Marginal from his book, Marginal and Merton, Mathematical Physics, Mathematics for Physics and Chemists. Uh, he was also a, a, a great philosopher, a very popular uh, actor in the middle part of the 20th century. And uh, so I wanted to work with him. I showed up at his doorstep. I had uh, uh, given some lectures in his course and um, uh, were friendly. And I said, Professor Marginal, I would like to do my thesis for you. I said, well, that's flattering, but I want you to go off and do physics and engineering using quantum mechanics, not philosophizing, but calculating. And that you publish 15 papers in quantum mechanics. Come back and see me. Oh, so I did. I went to work with uh, one of the like Willis Lamb, who got the Nobel Prize. But we were working on very specific uh, engineering like problems, the mathematics of gyroscopic motion of that. And uh, Arganau uh, always, always fascinated us by his uh, insights. And he was a, a good physicist, too, uh, but uh, a, a philosopher who can afford it. He says, makes possible the freedom of our will, which would contradict science with strict determinism regarding the future of the day. You remember the, the dialogue between Napoleon and Laplace. Laplace was explaining to Napoleon uh, the ideas gleaned from Newton that if we know the position of every atom in this part of gas and the momentum, then later in time, we can predict exactly where all these particles will be. And uh, in this sense, the future is completely determined by our knowledge of the present, or the past. And uh, Napoleon said, Well, sir, where is there? Is there room for God? The boss remember, said, I have no need for that hypothesis. But for Grand, another great mathematician, said, oh, but it's such a great hypothesis that explains so many things. So it's in this sense that uh, Marginal is talking about the freedom of our will, which is not governed by, not determined by the strict Newtonian determinants, but something deeper is more taking place. And it's this quantum mechanical feature Alluding to one of the great physicists of the 20th century, on a level that Einstein bore to the minds of us as physicists, was Wolfgang Power. And, uh, he did theoretical physics and was kind of the central figure in 20th century physics uh, after. Studying in Munich with Heisenberg. Heisenberg and Pauli were friends, were lab partners. Munich studying under the great uh, Professor Sommerbach. And uh, Pauli was always right there criticizing everybody's ideas. Einstein gave a talk. Pauli, coming to the younger, listened to the talk, stand up and said, Gentlemen, nothing Professor Einstein has said is wrong. 
great cartoon of uh, how in heaven God's at the blackboard. God is on the front row. No, no, no. So, Howie was, was uh, uh, the famous guy with deep insights and, and a real uh, doubter of everything in physics and doubter of everything in the universe, but a deep believer in a sort of mystical connection between physics, between science, and theology tradition. Makes makes this excellent uh, statement that uh, every time we endeavor to solve a problem, we are governed by factors outside of our control. The mere fact we are convinced that a solution exists is a gift that we have no right to, but it's this kind of gift that uh, uh, he associates with and compares to grace. John Bell, the physicist who is responsible for much of today's emphasis on quantum information, quantum computing, and quantum entanglement. He, by the way, was an engineer. He worked at CERN on building better particle so it was very, very difficult mathematical problem. And he also put the notion of quantum wave particle growth entanglement, quantum strainings in a way that could be tested experimentally. And he made this in one of his great papers. He says, suppose that quantum mechanics leads us to an indicator pointing outside the subject of quantum mechanics to the mind of the observer, to God, or to whatever. Would that not be very interesting? It's John Bell. And finally, we conclude with a quote from Copenhagen, who makes the statement that uh, in his opinion, open on, by the way, was a, a very respected uh, professor of elementary particle physics, and he was an Anglican Christian theologian. And uh, he takes these ideas uh, to the higher limit and indicates that in his opinion, the everlasting sense of mind, much in, in the spirit of training in the earlier statement, was a very uh, possible, coherent, acceptable. So that's not the end, that's the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, we are grateful to you, Wolfgang, for your contributions. For the fact that we as a species have been measurably improved, given us so many interesting things to think about, and so many problems that you didn't ever guess would uh, be occupying the minds of engineers. So, God bless Wolf and Murphy. Do you have time for some questions? Yes. Well, very interesting talk. Well, thank you so much. Um, I do uh, have a lot of things as well as my friends. I apparently do some graduate work for the night school as I get in the breath back. So I have a question. I also think philosophy aspects of it. We have very good discussion with our with my students. Um, so are you are aware of who, who can sweet swap? Yeah, like he talks about this double-slit experiment. He, he has a bigger framework, and where he calls, he says these things are particle formation. Like when you have, you know, observer, uh, like, you know, you have a double-slit experiment. And within that framework, uh, 
that is not operating well at home. So he has a you know proportion of quantum mechanics. Uh, and also, so I want to know what your uh, take on that. As well, uh, regarding, uh, I'm sure you, you know about Josephson, Brian Josephson, and uh, Nobel laureate who is Josephson, and he has been working on a so called mind matter interaction, which, and he was a professor in Cambridge, uh, you know, while I was graduate student. And of course, we get a problem. Who is this? This is Brian Josephson. Oh, Brian Josephson. Oh, yeah. great. Yeah, and everybody, any other, any other professor, I don't know what was talking to me and I, but every other professor would have a lot of the idea that the you know, know to, yes, okay, I agree. So he, at that time, he was proposing that our expectation can affect uh, quantum outcome. And him being Josephson, like a Nobel laureate, Cambridge didn't fire him, of course. And uh, like his theory was all well developed, and finally, his theory also got some traction. His students got into calculations and things like that. And I haven't followed up what happened. So, my particular question was to him that do you think it is possible that uh, Hindu yogi is a levitate? He said, Oh, that's easy. Thank you. I say thank you for several reasons. Interesting comment. Josephson was a dear friend of mine. He would come to MIT in the summers and we would work together on the physics of Josephson radiation. I radiation and uh, and the uh, Josephson. Feynman wrote in his book a nice little two line the Josephson idea is writing what we call the Feynman equation. But Josephson had a 40 years thesis deriving these ideas from what he did with PCF. And we always wondered. If we couldn't derive these finding equations from BCS, try and didn't do it. He went home and kept looking at God and published a paper. Can the finding equations of Josephson and the radiation be derived from BCS? Long time. The answer says yes. I got a letter from Feynman. He says, Dear Dr. Scully, I call what you're doing pandering. To the big guy, <laughs> <laughs> in my mind. I don't need credit for Josephson's work, and in the future, I will thank you to call the Josephson equations the Josephson equation, not the final equation. Simultaneously, I got a postcard from Joseph. He said, Congratulations on deriving the final equation. <laughs> so I send it to final. He writes back and says, Okay, okay, I guess you win. You can call them anything you like. I guess I'm human enough to be pleased. <laughs> Joseph's a great philosopher. And then what was thinking back then? He really was doing engineering, deep quantum engineering when he did what I didn't know about what you have any comments on who can speak for? Uh, Barnicat Foundation, uh, who can speak? Uh, uh, he's a mathematical physicist. He was at Yale too. And I think he is a slightly older than, you know, not a kind of Casaro, he was probably in his 1990s. He has this uh, old, uh, you know, documentary which was, you know, shown in the movie theater in the United States. And uh, that's called The One Month Finish And he wrote a few books. He, and he's a basic philosopher. So, uh, and he has the perfect position as one of the ways to be, you know, modified from the theory and not part of their function. And everything makes sense, apparently. My question was if we can devise some experiment that would test, uh, like, uniqueness or, you know, you know test his ideas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that, that's what we think quantum reasoning is. I think that's experimentally observed and fits into this people question. Observations. But Greenberg gave us a different insight into space time. He showed that if you take Minkowski, Einstein's space time, and try it into an accelerated observer moving this way, another accelerated observer moving this way, if you have a photon in Minkowski, Einstein's space, you'll now have entangled pairs of photons. And Greenberg right and left hand space. And that 
seems to be not only true, but a much deeper way of understanding uh, these ideas that uh, I think are associated with evaporation of black hole. Wow, thank you. Uh, if I may just uh, 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 I always felt the regular six time, uh, would be the no way, like, you know, would be in between. You know, it would be very crucial in understanding quantum mechanics, in, you know, quantum mechanics and general theory. Right. Email you know, me some of your ideas. I don't read email much, but you send them to me. My name is Akbar. That's where the Akbar is in the yeah, Akbar and he does. He needs to get some emails. Do we have any other questions? Earlier, yes, all the way up there. With regard to the double slip experiment, I have a confession. I'm dead. But I do read that makes two of us. With regard to the double slit experiment, right. we had this interference pattern, and then with an observer, the interference pattern disappears. Yeah. What happens if the observer is nearsighted? That is, he can only detect with a certain probability. What happens then? Yeah. So what happens if the observer is not a very good observer? And when you're erasing information, well, I'm not erasing totally, but I mean, he can only observe with a certain probability. He sometimes sometimes makes you sense. That's a good question. I can answer it mathematically. I can show you how the uh, answer for perfect detectors can be explained by having an array of detectors, each of which is perfect, but they give different probabilities associated with coupling. And then we showed that uh, there's still a partial eraser and restoration, but not total. And what, and what does that look like when it's partial? Looks like chapter seven of my book on quantum optics. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a physicist? Well, you're insulting me. No, I'm a mathematician. <laughs> Poor mathematician. I'm going to be just like you when I grow up. <laughs> Uh, a couple more hands up here somewhere, right? Yeah. You know, since we are speaking here about the cosmic scales, cosmology, there was experiment suggested by experiment about delayed fate. Delayed fate. Micron is going through the two slips. And then uh, the observer is on the other side of the slip. And this screen where you want to see the graph, you quickly push it down, and then looks at the two slits from the far distance. He says that he can influence the, the behavior by the delayed fate. Do you know this? Sure, sure. What do you think about delayed fate? That's chapter 21. It's <laughs> <laughs> not chapter 21, but I don't agree. I don't agree. That somehow what I do here has influenced what I observe there. But I do agree that my knowledge gleaned from measurements here affects how I analyze my data there. That's the way to say it. It isn't that somehow a measurement here instantaneously changes something over there, it's this other measurement process. Knowledge here changes. Eventuality, eventuality associated with my data reduction. Yeah, very deep question. It is, I think that they think they say that our universe yeah. is of particles, not of antiparticles, because of the delay during Big Bang. Well, universe I'm an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> No, then please join me all and think one more time.